everybody. I'm Karen Hartglass, and you are listening to It's All About Food. I'm so grateful for Zoom and the internet because it enables us to connect with people all around the world. And today we're reaching out to a very special person who happens to be in Israel. And I've spoken to him many times, Richard H. Forge, PhD. If you remember, he's the professor emeritus of the College of Staten Island, author of Judaism and Vegetarianism, Judaism and Global Survival, Mathematics and Global Survival, and Who Stole My Religion? Revitalizing Judaism and Applying Jewish Values to Help Heal Our Imperiled Planet. He's got over 250 articles at jewishveg.org forward slash Schwartz. He's the President Emeritus of Jewish Vegetarians of North America, President Society of Ethical and Religious Vegetarians, Associate Producer of the wonderful film, A Sacred Duty. And I want to celebrate you, Richard. Welcome to the program. Thank you. Thank you very much. I want to celebrate you because I've spoken to you a number of times hosting this podcast over 11 years. And I remember in 2014, we celebrated your 80th birthday. Correct. And if I do the math correctly, <laughs> that means you're 86 now. That's true, true, true. Very young. Oh, Hashem, Richard Schwartz, you're amazing. Oh, well, thank you. You're amazing, too, and I want to commend you. 11 years of tremendous service, wonderful programs, and I wish you many, many more years of success. Thank you. Well, for me, it's been a lot of fun because I learned so much, and I get to speak to so many wonderful people, but I'm just... I'm just in awe because you've been so prolific and you don't stop and you're so passionate about what you believe in. It's such an important cause and how would you not be uh, compassionate about it or passionate about it? Well, I mean, a lot of people, especially as they get older, they just want to have a good time. They want to relax. They want to eat. They want to drink. They want to forget about their troubles. (laughs) We have you here today because at 86 years old, you're still not stopping. And you have a number of things you want to talk about, including a new book. So let's jump into the first part of the discussion, which is restoring and transforming an ancient Jewish holiday. And I want to get all the details on this. But before we start, I want to talk about Judaism and how tradition is so important in Judaism and holding on to ancient customs. And so I was thinking... How is it that we lost touch with this particular holiday? And how are you planning to budge this group who don't like to change? Well, making change is difficult, but it's so essential. You know, it's like the world survival is at stake. It's not just a bit of movement here and there. You know, the climate experts are telling us that we have maybe only 10 years until about 2030 to make what they call unprecedented changes in order to have a chance of averting a climate catastrophe. And most people don't realize that animal-based diets are and agriculture are a major, major contributor to climate change. So that's one of the important things. And what we're doing is we're trying to bring basic Jewish teachings into practice and people, as you say, resistant to change and all, but uh, uh, as Rabbi Morgan Mead said, never doubt that a small group of individuals, dedicated individuals can change the world. That's the only thing that ever has. So we're giving that a try because uh, it's essential and thank God we have these powerful Jewish teachings. And the important thing, you know, we're not trying to change religion, we're trying to say Judaism has beautiful, powerful teachings, let's put them into practice because what good are great teachings if you're not putting them into practice? Very good. Okay, let's talk about this holiday and how you're going to transform and restore. What was it originally? I was trying to find information on it on on the World Wide Web, the internet, this Rosh Hashanah Lamasa Behima. Right. Well, actually, it was a new year for tithing for animals many years ago in the days of the temple. They had sacrifices there, but by the way, that was a common mode of worship, and uh, people just didn't have any other ways of worshiping at that time. But the Jews had a great step forward because in ancient times, there were terrible pagan practices, including human sacrifices and child sacrifices. So the thing is, in the 70s, in the common era, 
the temple was destroyed no more in need for sacrifices, and therefore it became a generally long, long forgotten holiday. So we want to bring it back, but make a major, major transformation. We want it to become a day devoted to increasing awareness of Judaism's very powerful teachings on compassion for animals and to show how, unfortunately, the realities for animals today are so far from these Jewish teachings. So that is the uh, main thrust. And uh, we've got a lot, the way of building up a, um, a, a coalition of organizations, rabbis, Jewish organizational leaders to, to get this back onto the agenda this year and building up all these names over the future. And I'm hoping by next year we can put together maybe a Haggadah, sample Seder. By the way, there's a precedent for this. So you know, two Bishvat, we're talking now about the uh, New Year for the animals, but there was a New Year for trees as well. And that also became sort of forgotten, but the mystics, the Kabbalists that fought in Israel in the 17th century brought that back and uh, made it a holiday to celebrate God's bounty with all kinds of fruits, etc., and all kinds of blessings. And in recent years, it's becoming very popular. It's becoming what you might consider a Jewish New Year. So it's been done before for the New Year for trees. We're going to try to do it for the New Year for animals, since it's so, so essential today. And again, it's using the basic Jewish teachings and saying, let's put them into practice. Uh, so we can be more consistent with Judaism and also very important to help shift our imperiled planet back onto a sustainable path. Okay, so this holiday that you want to transform as the holiday to celebrate the animals, the New Year for the animals. Originally, if I'm and understanding correctly, certain animals were selected to be slaughtered or tithed, which is a pleasant word <laughs> for the reality of being sacrificed. And then it was dropped because we realized sacrificing animals wasn't a good thing to do? Well, no, because the temple was destroyed in 70 in common era. You know, that's why we have this holiday called Tisha B'Av not too long ago, where we commemorate that and uh, try to learn from it and hopefully change our ways so that uh, there won't be need for further destructions. Unfortunately, a world today is still. Uh, what they call causeless hatred that caused the destruction of the, the temple. So yeah. again, temple destroyed, it wasn't needed. Holiday became very unfamiliar. If not, not kind of to have an average Jewish person that said, have you heard of the New Year for animals? Oh, we think, what are you crazy? <laughs> but we're going to bring it back, we're going to restore it, and we're going to make it popular so that people know Judaism has these powerful teachings. We have to put them into practice. And that can help in many ways and maybe bring idealistic Jews back who may be alienated and feel, uh, why aren't we applying Judaism to current uh, critical issues? Now, I understand Israel is very supportive or it has a growing vegan movement. Oh, absolutely. Uh, this is the world capital of veganism, has the highest percent, very strong teachings on compassion for animals. So much so that a number of years ago, the Supreme Court, using those laws, outlawed the production of pate de foie gras, which, you know, is very, very uh, harmful, forcing grain down the throats of animals. However, uh, compared to other countries, we're doing pretty well, but uh, comparing to an ideal standard, Maybe not so well. You know. It's amazing. Israel is the world cap veganism and also has the highest consumption of chicken of any country. You know, they say, what's a Friday night without chicken? I'm mean, unfortunately, so that's another tradition, but uh, right. many health problems caused by that. Well, that's the negatives. Yeah, I'm thinking of chopped liver too. You said that foie gras is, is um, not allowed to be manufactured, but chopped liver is made from cow's liver, right? Absolutely. And chicken fat. Oh, yeah, we have a ways to go. But, We've uh, got a ways to go, but on us there are right. some wonderful vegan recipes for vegan chopped liver, which I think are so much better. Mm -hmm. It's become a tradition in my family. 
Absolutely. Many great substitutes commercially are available, much easier to be a vegan nowadays than say 20, 30 years ago. I mean, they say now they have plant-based or vegan substitutes so good that uh, meat eater for decades can't tell the difference between plant-based burger and one created from animals. That's right. You're in a country that is more and more vegan friendly, so they might be more receptive than in other places to get excited about this transformation. What's the reaction so far? Well, reaction is super great among vegetarians, vegans, you know, people who are committed. Just a quick story that sort of illustrates the point. A rapper went out to give a sermon, and the wife said, what are you talking about? He said, well, I'm talking about how the wealthy should help support the poor. When he came back, the wife said, well, how'd it go? And he said, well, I'm halfway there. The poor are willing to accept the money. So that's the idea. Here, too, the, the uh, vegetarians and vegans, they're willing to accept this idea. They really like it. It's good. But to break through, uh, as you know, people are creatures of habit. Uh, I'm here, by the way, in this in a retirement center. I gave a talk about it. And somebody said, you know, we're 75, 80, 85 years old. You know, we're not going to change now. But thankfully, the young people are. So it's started. We hope to get this on the agenda. As you know, rabbis are super dedicated people. And we're going to try to get to them and say, you want Jews to be more consistent with Judaism. You're doing wonderful, wonderful things. But how can we ignore that animal-based diets and agriculture seriously violate at least six Jewish basic, basic mandates to take care of our health, to treat animals with compassion, to protect the environment, to conserve natural resources, to help hungry people, and to seek and pursue peace. So these are a, a basic, you know, it's tragic that there's uh, an epidemic of diseases so unnecessary because of the high cholesterol, saturated fat, or the additives, the uh, hormones, antibiotics. So this, it's like a win-win-win situation because if people shift to nutritious plant-based diets, helps their health, it certainly helps the animals, helps the environment, and we wouldn't be so wasteful of water and energy and land. And you know, it's a shame at a time where there's an estimated like 9 million people dying of hunger every year. Over 10% of the world's people uh, chronically hungry, almost 70% of the grain in the U.S. that's produced here in, in the United States is fed to animals destined for slaughter. So it's like uh, madness and sheer insanity. And not only so much fed to animals, but it takes a product high in fiber and complex carbohydrates, the void of saturated fat and cholesterol, puts it through an animal and the meat that comes out has just the opposite, the negative health effects. So we're going to combat that madness and sheer insanity. With yes. The situation. All the facts are there for health, environment, for, for cruelty to animals. All the facts are there. Okay, so you've got this holiday. We're going to restore and transform it. What have you got planned? Are there going to be events or articles? No. What, what, yeah. What's in the... Well, that, that, you mentioned articles. Just be uh, interviewed by a freelance writer. So uh, as we speak now on Wednesday, this Friday, there'll be a major, major article in the Jerusalem Post. I've sent out press releases and articles in many papers. This is the third interview I've had this week. So getting it word out. But mainly this year it's to get things on the agenda. So we're planning, you know, the new technology with Zoom, which you're now speaking on is really so wonderful. We're going to have so far a major Zoom event in the US and Israel hoping also in the UK, but that still uh, needs a little bit of work on it. And in these, we're going to have six, seven or so speakers, rabbis, environmentalists, a doctor in one case, talking about the importance of renewing and transforming the holiday and how it will help medically, how it will help the environment, how certainly, certainly it will reduce the incredible, horrendous treatment of animals on factory farms. We're in the middle of a pandemic. Yeah, yeah. I'm not sure how things are going in Israel with regard to the coronavirus. Mm -hmm. 
not so but, good. Not so good. So a lot of people are not going to their places of worship, but in some ways that's an opportunity because there are more opportunities to gather on the internet Correct. and and you can access more people. Right. That's what gave me this idea. You know, at first it's a chance you can't get together. You can't go out. We're sort of locked in here, by the way, unless we have to go out for a doctor's appointment or something. But now with Zoom, People uh, all over the world, if I say you uh, Zoom in America, Zoom in Israel, et cetera, et cetera. And I'm glad you mentioned the pandemic, because that's another reason to do and restore this holiday. As you know, this pandemic, we, we've had so many wake up calls before. We've had other pandemics, MERS, SARS, Ebola virus, the uh, uh, bird flu, bird. Uh, pandemic at all, and, and the swine flu, et cetera, et cetera. So it's essential to stop the massive mistreatment of animals and consumption of animals to reduce the chance of future pandemics. I mean, you think this has been so devastating. There's so many loss of lives, loss of incomes, businesses shut down. So that's another important reason. So I say, win, 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 win situation. So we're hoping it it builds up and takes off more and more. And one additional thing I'm doing, I'm gathering lists of organizations, rabbis, influential Jews who support this, just to show that there's a lot of momentum behind it and uh, and hoping uh, each of people on the list will contact others. So, you know, it's like hopefully it'll be a very positive domino, domino effect. So you're sharing this ancient holiday and transforming it. Now, what is the new holiday going to look like? Well, it's going to be called uh, just the Jewish New Year for Animals. And that's what we're going to try to do this year. You know, I mentioned before Tu B'Shvat, and that was sort of patterned on Passover. And there's a Seder there, also involving four cups of grape juice or wine. But in this case, they changed the color from uh, from white to pink to ruby to red to uh, indicate the four seasons. You know, the Kabbalists had a lot of ideas of different four worlds. So uh, I, I prepared a rough Haggadah, but a lot of work has to be done on So we thought maybe four cups. I thought the first cup, uh, during that, we were teaching about Jewish teaching of compassion for animals. The second cup, what are the realities for animals? Maybe the third cup, talk about different animal rights, vegetarian, environmental groups, what are they doing? Maybe the fourth is to look to the future, what can we do, et cetera. So this is just an initial idea, and there's tremendous wisdom out there. So I'm hoping a year from now, maybe come back to your wonderful program and tell you we've got all kinds of savings all over the world and all that, and here is a whole bunch of ideas. You know, it's, it's open, of course, it's going to be different than before, so it's not going to be a set. But of course, the Passover Seder is pretty much set with the Haggadah, you know, step one, two, three, and all that. So here, it's going to be open, and it may take a year or two or three to evolve and finally come up with what the best approach will be. But if nothing else, hopefully rabbis will give sermons around this period. Hopefully, there will be gathering, vegetarian speaking gatherings where people, as a minimum, will discuss teachings about animals and how can we make the uh, treatment of animals more consistent with basic Jewish teachings. So what I'm understanding is you're not really telling people that they have to go vegan or eat or not eat animals. You're just broadening their understanding of animals' impact on the planet, on climate change, what we're doing to them, and then hopefully they can make an educated choice you know, in their own life. Choice, but people should, should know, and they should know it's very, very consistent with Judaism. There's some that say, you know, you have to eat meat, have to eat on Shabbat and all that, and we have many teachings in my book, Judaism and Vegetarianism, I have many questions and answers that respond to that. By the way, there were press rabbis and former chief rabbis that were strictly vegetarian or vegan, when, even on Shabbat, on holidays. So, where I put it, there's a choice. 
and the Jews can be vegetarians, vegans, hopefully, or not. But the important thing is, in making that choice, shouldn't people consider basic Jewish teachings, especially those who take the Torah and Jewish teachings seriously? And again, there's such strong teachings on protecting our health. Matter of fact, one of the teachings I use, there's something in the Torah that says, and it's my time to be old, when I shall take him, very diligently guard your health. There's 16, 613 mitzvot or commandments. Only one of them uses that word my old, which means very much. So diligently guard you. In addition, there's 613 mitzvot, but 610 can be overridden if a person's life is in danger. The only three that uh, cannot are prohibition against murder, sexual morality, and uh, idol worship. So very strong to and compassion for animals. Jews are supposed to be, they say, Rachmanim B'nai Rachmanim, which means compassionate, children of compassionate ancestors, imitating a God, who according to Psalms 145, number nine, God's compassion is over all of his works, all of his creatures. So very consistent with Judaism. And we want to point out to rabbis very respectfully, again, who want you to keep kosher, to observe Shabbat, and, and you know, the wonderful sermons and teachings about that. This is also extremely important to take care of our health, treat animals with compassion, and to protect our very, very much, unfortunately, imperiled planet. I want to talk about your new book a little bit, but before we move on to that, can you do you want to add anything about this holiday where people might go to find more information? Age, not quite yet. Anyway, I will just give my email address so if people want to contact me and looking to always get help and all. And I am going to send out widely, and I hope it gets to people, the link to the uh, Zoom events I mentioned. So my email address is one word, Reggie Rich at gmail.com, and that's V E. G G I E R I C H, which the first four letters of my name, Richard, at gmail.com. Okay, I'll link that in the archive for this interview. Also, or on that, I have, I think you mentioned, thank you for a very kind introduction, for 250 articles, and by the way, 25 podcasts at a website, and that's the same Jewish badge, one word, K E W I S H V E G, of course. Uh, not, I think O-R-G and C-O-M, I think both were, but try O-R-G, and that same forward slash, and then the spelling of my last name, S-C-H-W-A-R-T-Z. You've written a bunch of books, and now you have a new one coming out in September, Vegan Revolution, Saving the World, Revitalizing Judaism. How is that different from your other books? What's new in it, different from your other books? Well, the others, way back, people were more into vegetarianism. So number one, it's more on veganism rather than vegetarianism. Second, we're finding out more and more about, as I said before, the climate threats. Unbelievable. Anyway, just to give an example, every year, over the 20 years this century, 20 years, every one is in the top 21 warmest years. And there's a good chance this year may break the record, or if not, it will be within the top two or three, probably. So the world's heating up, the glaciers are melting, or ice caps are melting, and there's more storms, more severe storms, et cetera, et cetera. So much so, I quote Jerry Brown, the former governor, humanity is on a collision course with nature. So it has a lot more about that. It also talks about the... Um, fact that in Israel, as we've been saying, there's more and more movement, especially among the young, and the fact that so many products are coming out on uh, that. So it's just it's an update and the movement, as they say, from vegetarian to veganism, and stressing that the world is super, super threatened. We're on a path which could be the end of humanity. It's really unbelievable because in 2015, 195 nations, just about every nation in the world met in, a, in Paris for a climate change conference. And you know, 
you look at Israel now, the U.S., you think of all the political disagreements, you know, everybody is yelling and screaming. And yet in Paris, 195 nations got together and they all agreed. Amazing that climate change is a major threat and we must immediately take action. And almost all of them made pledges that they're going to reduce greenhouse gases so much by 2025 or, you know, different pledges. Now, unfortunately, those pledges are not binding. Many nations are not quite there. But even if, if every nation, 195 nations, if they all met the targets, the temperature from pre-industrial days, which has gone up by about 1.1 degrees Celsius, would go up. So instead of 1.1, it would be 3.1, almost a tripling by the end of the century. I mean, you think of how many storms and droughts and the, the deserts are growing and the forests are with wildfires. So if we have all that with one, imagine with three, it could be uninhabitable. And I've been blessed by the way, mentioned I'm in Israel, just celebrated our fourth anniversary a week or so ago. And we've been blessed with three grandchildren getting married and finally become a great grandfather for the first time. And when I think of a couple getting married, if a born, what kind of world are they going to have unless, as the Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change indicated, we have, quote unquote, unprecedented changes, and this is the kind of change that is needed. You know, we need bold, audacious actions, and I'm hoping this will do it, and we're going to, you know, really push very respectfully to get this onto the agenda. Well, as I said at the beginning of the program, I love your passion. I love your commitment to your beliefs, your integrity, you too. <laughs> your persistence. I wish more people were like you. And I'm wondering, what do you attribute to your longevity? Well, um, thank God I uh, have a little bit of muscle and uh, all that. I hope the vegetarian diet and not a vegan diet helps. I try to be active now in the retirement center. I go to the gym and the pool a bit every day. Right. And a little bit muscle, I hope. And uh, <laughs> uh, maybe, maybe the fact that I have the passion and commitment that I like, something to live for, I feel. So hopefully all of them can get. <laughs> I love how hopeful you are. It's very inspirational. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> You're welcome. I'm thinking about, and I don't know if you have an opinion on this, but I'm just thinking off the top of my head, I know that Israel is big with technology. There's a lot of high-tech stuff going on there. In addition to what's going on with nanotechnology and integrated circuits and semiconductors and all that stuff, there's also a lot of technology with cultured meats. And there's an interesting question about whether things made from animal cells can be kosher. Right. And I'm wondering okay. what your thoughts are on that. Okay, I actually have a chapter in this new book, you asked what's different, so that's one different thing. I have a whole chapter on it. And a lot of products were made in Israel. It's like a major factor, like you mentioned, the technology. Israel is called a startup nation, and there are so many uh, things happening, et cetera. Okay, so my thing is, I did some investigation, and the rabbis so far, I guess it's been more and more looking into it, feel it will be kosher, not quite vegan since it is related to an animal. So my thing is, I wouldn't eat it myself, that kind of product, but, but it's a great step forward in that instead of the current 60 billion or so animals today with all the pollution that's caused and it, it's the, um, Methane emitted from these animals is a major contributor so that a UN study found that the animal sector emits more greenhouse gases, greenhouse gases <laughs> than all the cars, planes, ships, all the means of transportation worldwide combined. So it's a step forward in that it reduced the pollution, the uh, climate effect from greenhouse gas emissions uh, certainly, even though animals are, I guess, mistreated to a certain extent compared to what it is now, it would be much less. Hopefully, the environmental effect will be less. You won't need, hopefully, so much water and energy. Hopefully, you wouldn't need the hormones and antibiotics that affect animals now. So, 
uh, I'm, I'm for it, even though I wouldn't myself partake in it. But again, I have a chapter on it. I'm curious. I, I remember learning that certain things were considered kosher that I don't consider vegan because kosher and vegan are not the same thing. No. For example, there's the chemical L-cysteine that's derived from duck feathers, and it's used as an additive in bread. And my understanding is that it was decided that could be kosher because it's gone through a lot of manipulation, and I don't understand how that can be kosher. It's certainly not vegan. Mm -hmm. Well, there's a technical thing in terms of kosher, but uh, it's meant to be certainly more humane. And a lot of people, by the way, look at the slaughterhouse and the, the uh, laws of Chiquito or kosher slaughter were designed to minimize pain. However, assuming that is true, it forgets about the many months of extremely cruel treatment of animals on factory farms. So uh, in a technical sense, somebody can say, well, it met X, Y, and Z, but it forgets for A, B, C, D, all the tremendous mistreatment. So we have a, one of our greatest spokespeople who was here in Jerusalem, Rabbi David Rosen, and he, he indicates that uh, it's really inconsistent with Jewish teachings and, and fundamentally shouldn't even be considered kosher when you realize how negative it is for the health and how animals are so mistreated. And this is why we want again with this new house for a minute to awaken people and say, we have such beautiful, beautiful teachings, but look what's happening here. Get familiar with how animals are treated. And one other factor, by the way, is there's been a number of scandals with regard to kosher supervision. You know, when you, I'm sure most of the inspectors are honest and all that, but you know, when you have a multi billion dollar industry, uh, things can go wrong. And uh, there have been cases where people just hasn't worked. There was one investigation where a supervisor, if he supervised all the places that he said he did, he would have had to work 27 hours a day. So it's a lot of that. So if somebody wants to really be more truly kosher, not to mention the fact that in the kitchen, you know, 365 days of a uh, year, you have meat sink here and milk and all, but it's so easy to once in a while get things mixed up and all. So another factor for vegetarian veganism on these kinds of diets. Well, one last question before I let you go. I want to know what you're eating these days <laughs> and what some of your favorite foods are. Okay, well, every day I make a salad with all kinds of uh, vegetables, with some hummus, avocado in it, uh, and uh, we add chia seeds and other things and some nuts and seeds and uh, lemon juice, so we have that. And every Shabbat, my wife makes like uh, sometimes a chillant in the winter, a vegan chillant, otherwise a stuffed fry that has everything from mushrooms, mixed vegetables, all kinds of things. So, uh, and I love these summer fruits and vegetables. So, uh, as, as you know, there's far more foods in the plant kingdom than in the animal kingdom. And, um, you know, the burgers are not as healthy as some of the fruits and vegetables, but every once in a while, some burgers and potatoes and corn. So, all kinds of good foods. And thankfully, we can say a blessing to God giving us this bounty. Well, I haven't been in Israel since 1988, 32 years. That's where I went vegan. Mm -hmm. But what I remember most is the vegetables were the most amazing, the fruits and the vegetables. And I hope they're still the same, if not better. Mm -hmm. They were colorful and fresh and full of flavor. It was so easy to eat them just as they were because they were so wonderful. Absolutely. People say, you know, you're vegan, you don't have milk or eggs or meat. What do you eat? But it, it, and, you know, we have visitors over here sometimes, and they see it. They realize that my wife makes uh, many, many courses and stuff. And uh, now, thank God, there's you know, people having vegan weddings, and they're showing more and more caterers getting familiar with it. So that's really working very well. 
Well, Richard Schwartz, thank you for your time and for your dedication. I hope you live till 120 at least. You too, thank you. It's been a pleasure to be on. By the way, this Zoom is great because very often I'm on the radio and I'm talking just to thin air, but the fact that I can see you and see your reactions and all, it, it makes it just uh, so much better and much more fun. I agree. I'm giving you a hug. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> We're only a thousand miles away, but I can feel it. <laughs> oh, good. Thanks so much. Be well. You too. All the best. Take okay, bye-bye. Hello. <laughs> okay, that was Richard Schwartz, everybody. I hope you enjoyed that conversation about resurrecting an old holiday and making it something meaningful and purposeful today. And I'm here with Gary DiMatte. Hi, Karen. And, you know, you... If you've been about that for a long time, re-energizing, reinvigorating great works of the past, especially in theater. It's interesting that you bring that up because resurrecting a work of theater or, or adapting a story for film or for the stage is all about taking a second look at it and maybe finding something. When I say maybe finding something, I'm talking about the individual who's doing the adapting. So the individual who is doing the adaptation of the story or the holiday is now taking it and putting their own, they're finding something about that holiday or something about that story, and they're finding that one particular piece of it very interesting, and so they're re-energizing this particular story and focusing on that one thing that they, as an individual, find interesting. And so what Richard found interesting about this holiday was that animals were celebrated, but they were also slaughtered. And An interesting thing that humans right, do, right? right. Yeah. So it didn't make much sense to Richard. So hats off to Richard. But I know you can't take your hat off if you're <laughs> orthodox. So it's really a cool thing to take something that didn't make sense in the first place and then try and bring it back and have it make a little more sense. I think animals should be celebrated, but you shouldn't slaughter them in order to celebrate them. It's a very strange abstract concept, but you know, adaptations have always been about taking a second look at something and finding whatever was interesting about it in the first place and trying to bring that part of it out and then trying to look at why animals were slaughtered in the first place. And it never made any sense to them even then, so... I'm thinking, Gary, that you are someone, and you may not even realize this, who has answers about what to do today in today's crisis. So you read a lot, and mm -hmm. you read plays a lot, and history repeats itself over and over and over. Humanity has been here before. Right. And humanity has gotten out of what they've been in before because we're here now. Mm -hmm. And there are many plays that you study that have told a story from a catastrophe or an internal conflict. It could be even an individual or it could be a town. And the journey we go through and how we get out of it and how we rise to the top. So here we are. And we're in New York City. And there are many people who say New York City's not coming back. Right. We don't know what's going to happen. So there's a lot of movement. There are people that are leaving. There are people that are staying. There are people that can't move. I think most of the people can't move because they don't have the means or the flexibility. They're in place. Sometimes it takes real desperation to move. You're always asking about your own Italian ancestors and why they moved and left such a beautiful place. What we're told is they were starving. Right. You know, the show is called It's All About Food. They left for food. It's very true. I'm not sure what that has to do with this conversation with well, Richard Well, the conversation Schwartz. is taking an idea. For Richard, it was a holiday. And bringing it to the current time and making sense of it. Reimagining it so that it, it tells a new story. It makes sense today. I guess you, if you're going to question a holiday that was supported by a religion, you have to then question the entire religion. Sure. Right? Mm -hmm. So people are now trying to make sense of some of these old ways of religions that now don't make mm -hmm. sense. Yeah. And so I guess that's a good sign because we're trying to evolve. Here is a holy man 
Richard Schwartz is a holy man. Mm -hmm. And he's trying to make sense of certain things that, that the religion that he practices has done to better the religion. That's really, I think, a wonderful life purpose. So we either stick with what we have and we change it and we try to make it better. Or we just abandon it and start from scratch. I think that's probably what a lot of people are feeling right now about what's going on in the world is that nature is abandoning humans. Nature is abandoning humans. That's good because we have been so awful to nature for so long. We have been awful to the animals in the name of religion. And this is something that Richard was, uh, was bringing out. And with context with our show, It's All About Food, I think Rosh Hashanah is a holiday that celebrates itself by doing what most holidays do, and that is eating certain foods. Certain foods, saying certain prayers, singing certain songs. There's all kinds of rituals. Right. So for vegans, Rosh Hashanah, I believe, and I'm not Jewish. I wasn't raised Jewish as you were. Uh, I was raised Catholic. I've celebrated these holidays with you over the past 12 years and enjoyed them very much. And one of the Correct me if I'm wrong, one of the foods that we celebrate this holiday with is the apple, and originally it was honey, correct? Yes, yes. But then you and I have kind of, and a lot of other vegans have used agave. Because it's honey-like, but I think this year maybe it'll be date paste. Date paste, right. (laughs) So you dip apples in honey traditionally, but we have dipped apples in agave or some other kind of... Syrupy the sweet. idea is it's for a sweet ear. The reason we don't do honey is because as vegans, we feel that exploiting any animal, even a bee, is wrong. It's in line with what Richard was talking about with uh, slaughtering animals, obviously. Gathering honey, you are in many respects harming the bee. Well, you can have hives. And you can help bees live and help them pollinate, but I don't think you need to take their food, their honey. And so that is shared with other vegans, share that same philosophy. Yes, and and bees, I mean, you bring up an interesting subject, but bees are a gray area in veganism because there are some vegans that say you can use products from bees and have hives and grow their honey, and then others will say, well, they're not really vegans. And I say, it's not worth arguing about. Mm-hmm. There are much bigger things to talk about. There's bigger tofu to fry. Absolutely. And when it comes to sweeteners like honey or agave, again, it's not something that I want to promote as something we need to consume. It's a nice treat. It's not something that we need for life. It doesn't provide essential nutrition. It's just nice. Yes. For those of you who don't know what the high holidays are, fill us in on what that is and what are some of the foods that you, when you were growing up, what are some of the traditional foods in addition to honey? Well, I'm not the expert here and I don't practice. What Mm -hmm. I do is I like to take some of the traditional foods that I remember having when I grew up and veganize them and enjoy them. Right. Maybe during the holiday time, it brings back a nice feeling. Sure. Everybody does that. And we have, I think, two versions of the honey cake on our website. One's gluten-free and one's with wheat. I'm not sure. I know we have honey cakes on our website, Responsible Eating and Living. The idea is to eat a lot of sweet foods for a sweet year. The new year, just basically, it's a new beginning and what comes... A couple of weeks after the new year is the solemn holiday of Yom Kippur, where everyone fasts for a day from sundown to sundown and asks for forgiveness. And the thing that I love, which I know many people don't do, we were taught this when we were young, is that if there's something you've done in the year that was wrong and you know it, you need to go to the person and ask them for forgiveness, which can be a very difficult thing to do. And we were taught that if the person does not forgive you, you have to approach them a total of three times, sincerely, asking them for forgiveness. And if they do not forgive you, then God will forgive you. Mm -hmm. But it really requires some effort to acknowledge your wrongdoing and ask for forgiveness. That's powerful. A lot of people live with a lot of guilt in their life for doing something wrong and being forgiven for something has a lot of 
power. And if someone won't forgive you, well, they say God will forgive you. But I think the message is you should forgive yourself. Very nice. Very nicely put, Karen. It starts on Friday, September 18th. So we have some time to think about all of the things that we've done wrong. And it ends Sunday, September 20th, according to the the thing about the New Year is Rosh Hashanah 2020 will begin in the evening of Friday, September 18th and ends in the evening of Sunday, September 20th. We're also told that this is when we are inscribed in the Book of Life or not. So the idea is during the new year, it's determined whether we will live or not. I'm not saying I believe in these things. This is just something we were taught. It's going to be an interesting time because we're in a pandemic with coronavirus. Things are like never before for all of us who are on the planet today. Yeah, lots of craziness going on with weather. Absolutely with weather. Climate change and all of the things that are happening in different parts of the world. There's a lot of Mother Nature is getting a little cranky. (laughs) Yeah, it's not nice to fool Mother Nature. Oh, remember that commercial? (laughs) Yeah, what was that? That was for... A butter? A a margarine, right? Yeah, margarine. Oh, God. And again, that's... (laughs) That's very interesting because they were trying to fool us with telling us that... Something was something that it wasn't. That butter was from nature, right? Right. It's not from nature, per se. It's taking something from an animal that doesn't belong to you and turning it into something coagulated (laughs) that you put on your bread. And that's marketing. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Marketing is the real evil devil. You know, I think marketing could be used for good at some point because marketing is so powerful at ma- manipulating the way we think. It's all about marketing. Remember? I know you remember this. Remember the marketing campaigns against litter when we were kids? Yes, of course. That was powerful and that was positive. And I understand that they're using it in small pockets here and there, marketing anti-litter campaigns and things like that. Marketing can do some good. Sure. So here's to positive marketing. Positive marketing. Absolutely. I agree. Holidays are coming up. Kids are going back to school. Some of them. Some of them aren't going back to school. Parents are confused about whether or not they should send their children to school. And if not, there's going to be a lot of kids learning from home. And that means they're going to be sitting around eating lunches at home without their friends. I wonder how many kids are going to think about going vegan this new school year. They should be teaching that in school. They should. I mean, if everybody's going to go their own direction, we're all going our own in our own direction about how we feel about things. Wearing masks, not wearing masks. Shouldn't we also be giving them the options to make intelligent decisions? This educate, is a really good point, Gary. Right? And I know you've had humane educators on this program before. But I think maybe having a class online that gives young people the option of whether or not they want to go vegan or not. It's a really good idea. I know that there are some children and teenagers and young adults who live with their parents and want to go vegan and their parents are not open to it. So they have a particularly difficult time doing so and think, I'll do it when I'm living on my own. This time may bring things to a head. Sure. I mean, this is all in line with talking about sacrificing animals to show your appreciation for animals. I mean, we do this every single day all throughout (laughs) the world. We sacrifice animals in our kitchens while we have, while we celebrate our pets who live with us. A lot of people do this. And I don't know if they're aware of what they're doing. So maybe as Richard Schwartz did with bringing this holiday back and trying to explain what people were doing in the name of celebrating animals, they were slaughtering them. Maybe we should educate the families of America on what they are in reality doing and putting it in simple terms such as that. You're celebrating your animal by by giving it this wonderful home, by rescuing it from a shelter, by feeding it, but then you're also slaughtering animals to feed your family. It doesn't quite make sense. Things are definitely going to change. And with more children staying at home and with more parents working from home, we will see a lot of change. And clearly people are cooking more at home. The question is, are they cooking things that are healthy for them or not? And we know that we can 
survive this coronavirus better if we're eating better. This is a message that needs to get out. It's kind of a heavy message today. We're, we're feeling kind of heavy, I guess. We should lighten it up a little bit, right? Lighten it up. Lighten it up. I posted the lentil crepes and lentil waffle recipe. Yeah, so let's talk about what we've been eating here at home. We haven't been sacrificing any animals. We've been sacrificing lots of lentils. <laughs> <laughs> a lot of people have been talking about the things that they've been doing while sheltering in place. And people have started up new projects or committed to something like cooking or exercising like we've been doing. But just like the new year, when people make resolutions, they get excited or out of need, start something, but then often they don't continue through with it. I've been reading a lot of posts by people saying all the things that they've tried to do, but they're not sticking with it. And I have to say that we, you and I, something I'm I'm really very proud of is we have been sticking with the changes that Certainly. we've made since we've hunkered down. And you know this whole this whole conversation is going in the right direction because we're talking about another chance to make some New Year's resolutions because it's the New Year. Oh, the Jewish New Year. Of the Jewish <laughs> New Year. We are right in line with the discussion on what what's to come by those who celebrate the Jewish New Year and or those who don't necessarily celebrate the Jewish New Year, but maybe would like to take an opportunity to make some new resolutions. And hey, the Jewish New Year is right around the corner. So you can, and you're still going to be okay. If you need a reason, yeah, here it is. So it people is. seem to need a way or a motivation or inspiration to start from scratch. Right. Turn the page. They need a throwback Thursday in order for them to post a picture of uh, something that they did a long time ago. It's, it's interesting how we... We put ourselves in these positions and then we don't like the position we're in, but yet we don't realize that we've actually put ourselves here. I was a person who was overweight all of my life and I, I put myself in that position by putting the food in my mouth and swallowing it. And then once I did, I didn't like where I had brought myself and I found it was almost impossible to reverse course until I made peace with my food and I've heard a lot of people say making peace with their food by going vegan is the way they lost weight. This is a good time to realize that we kind of have brought ourselves to wherever we are in life. And we need to work extremely hard to reverse that. It's not easy. Nothing's so, easy. And then that's where marketing comes in and says, oh, sure, it's easy if you take this pill, if you try this diet, if you... You know, sign up for my course for six weeks. I'll I'll make sure that, you know, you can reverse all of these things that took you years and years and years to get to. And we're saying at Responsible Eating and Living, there is no pill. There is no book. There is no course. You just have to really have the truth presented to you so that you can make informed decisions. People are creatures of habit. Right. And people, whether they like it or not, most people like routine. A lot of people are talking about their freedom and how they don't want their freedoms taken away. They don't want to wear a mask because they want to be free or they do want to wear a mask, whatever it is. I think most people like routine and our routines have been shaken up. And now we have to face ourselves. There's a lot of opportunity to look in and what, what am I? Who am I? What am I doing? What is this life all about? And I don't have the answers. But I I do know that when we wake up in the morning, and many of us when we wake up don't feel very good. We're right. kind of faced with a heaviness, some dread. We call it the belly, the belly full of, of dread. dread. It wasn't always like that for me. Maybe it was for many people. It really depends on the individual situation. I know that I didn't feel this kind of feeling until I went through my cancer experience. Before that, I used to wake up and not really feel anything. It was just like, okay, I'm going to start the day. But now I feel the heaviness. To get away from that heaviness, it's useful to have a morning routine. A strategy. A strategy. Exercise is a good morning routine to get you out of that heaviness or meditation. And a friend of mine just gave me the gift of a little matcha kit. And the matcha... Yeah, why don't you explain what that is? Matcha is green tea. And it's actually the leaves, the fresh leaves that have been ground into a powder. And there's a special way to do this. I'm not an expert or know how to do it. But the resulting powder is very bright green. 
and there's a way to prepare it where you sift it through a sieve and then add the water. And it's important that the water be not hotter than 175 degrees Fahrenheit. And then you whisk it. And the ceremonial method uses a bamboo whisker. And you whisk it for two to three minutes vigorously. It gets a nice creamy white foam on the top. And a then bamboo you whisker. It. Yeah. That has multiple meanings. A bamboo whisker. I have whiskers and they're bamboo. How do you shave your bamboo whiskers? No, but this bamboo whisker does look like a shaving brush. Yes, it does. It's a whisk. You know, everybody uses whisks to whip up their aquafaba and all of that. But this is a a whisk made of bamboo. Yeah. It looks like a shaving brush. So a bamboo whisker. You wanted to take it from me to use as a shaving brush. I find some peace. Just going through the few minutes of preparing this matcha. A friend of mine gave me the kit because he really wasn't interested in going through this. Karen is the only one that receives gifts from friends throughout the year. It's funny. (laughs) Hi, Karen. I thought of you. I thought I'd send you this. Yeah, but it's a gift. It's a re-gift, something that they didn't want. Well, it's awesome. It was an awesome gift. But I think that we And you're getting lots of enjoyment out of it. I am. This routine, this ritual thing, I think has some kind of benefit to uplift us out of whatever heaviness or dread we may start the day with. Well, I find that dread is caused because we aren't living in the moment. Dread is caused by thinking about the future and thinking about the past. So you mentioned meditating. Mm -hmm. You have to tell yourself when you wake up, I know I've got this belly full of dread and why? And it's because I'm thinking about all of the things yet to come that haven't come yet or all of the things that have happened already that you are maybe not feeling great (laughs) about. And again, it ties in with this guilt that you were talking about, which this holiday addresses by saying, if you've done something wrong, go ask the person to forgive you. And if they don't forgive you after three times, the higher power will, f- will forgive, forgive you. Or you just forgive yourself. Or you yourself. forgive yourself. And I think that's the point I'm trying to make is you have to move on. You have to move on. You have to. It's like bringing yourself, like I brought myself to almost 300 pounds. And it took years and years and years and years and years to get my body that big. And it took a lot of work to get it back to a a size that I was okay with. And you look great now. I want to say that I'm grateful for Richard Schwartz for bringing up this topic about taking an old holiday and bringing some new purpose and sense to it for today. It's kind of drummed Metaf- up a lot of different ideas. It's a metaphor for what you can do with your own life. Exactly. And just on that, we're out of time. Wow, what a perfect way to wrap it up. Great yeah. show. Thank you, Gary, once again for joining me. On it's all about food. Thank you for this religious experience. <laughs> all about veganism is, and all about food is, is a religion. Is a philosophy that I think everyone should follow. Yeah. So on that note, everybody, have, have a, a delicious, delicious week. week.